Hey, greetings. Uh, I'm really, really excited about this online presentation. My name is Jim Adkins, and I live down in Mango County, West Virginia. And uh, I am very, very, very privileged to do this online presentation. And the title of my presentation is what is a real chicken? What is a real chicken? And this will be an introduction to raising uh, sustainable poultry. All right. If you're interested in and in starting your own flock and and getting involved in breeding and growing and marketing your own chickens, then this would be for you. So. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful to have the invitation for the 2020 West Virginia Urban Ag Conference, the Urban Agriculture Conference. So thank you for um, pulling me up and listening to this presentation. And uh, what I'm going to do in the next 30 minutes is I am going to explain to you what does a, a, a true sustainable chicken, sustainable genetics, what do they what, what, what would it look like? And uh, first, let me tell you a little bit about me. Um, I'm originally from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and um, I uh, all of my childhood life, I loved birds. I still love birds. Um, Love birds, love birds. When I was a kid, I wanted all all the wild birds coming to my house. So I'd have bird feeders and bird houses and, and bird bass. I wanted all the wild birds coming to my house. And so then in the middle of my sixth grade year of school, my parents decided they were tired of the Midwest snow in Wisconsin. And we moved to Washington State. We moved to Washington State. So when we moved to Washington, around about 1980, I, when we arrived in Washington State, my dad got about five acres of land and he bought some baby chicks. And I'm like, wow, who needs wild birds when you can have your own? And so that was my introduction to poultry. We went to the feed store and we got some baby chicks. And I remember my first rooster, his name was King Tut. He was a, an aggressive Rhode Island red male and a rooster and or a, a male chicken or a cockbird is what we'd call him. And so, but I still have scars in the back of my legs from that bird. And uh, anyway, so that was my introduction to chicken. So it's been about almost 40 years, almost 40 years I've been involved with sustainable poultry production. And so that was my introduction. So as a teenager, I started breeding uh, and showing and exhibiting poultry, standard breeds of poultry. And that's what I'm going to explain to you. But I started showing them. And then along the way, I, I um, I wanted to get involved in being a chicken judge. And so I saw these chicken judges when I was showing birds at county fairs and state fairs and poultry exhibits. And I'd watch these, these poultry, these chicken judges fly in from all over the United States. And that was one of my childhood aspirations. I wanted to be a chicken judge. And so uh, in 19, I think 1994, I became a licensed poultry judge. And so since then, I have judged all over the United States and almost 40 states, judged in multiple countries, judged in Australia a few times. And then um, a little bit later in life, I went to work for a large turkey producing company. It was a, a large organic turkey farm. In the state of California, we raised about a million turkeys a year, about a million birds. I managed, I was a field supervisor and we, I managed about five ranches that grew out about 450,000 birds. So um, I went from being a small chicken guy, backyard, well, I had chickens, ducks, geese, turkeys, never had guineas, wasn't into guineas, but 
So I went from kind of being the, the small farmer to the industrial side of a million turkeys a year is what we raised. And I'll tell you, when I worked for that company, I learned a lot about the industrialization of chickens. Well, specifically turkey. But I learned so much about the industry of the big boys like Tyson chicken and like butterball turkeys. And so um, I've been around lots and lots of fowls for many, many years. And so um, in 2010, we launched... Uh, we founded, I've had the privilege of founding the Sustainable Poultry Network USA. And our website is spnusa.com. And so um, we founded the Sustainable Poultry Network in December of 2010. Uh, I was living in North Carolina at the time. And so we're coming up on our 10-year anniversary December of 2020 will be 10 years since we founded the Sustainable Poultry Network. And basically, the network is all about training people. Actually, we hang our hat on three things. Training, coaching, and mentoring. Training people in giving them understanding about sustainable poultry production and coaching them and implementing the principles and the things that we teach, and ultimately multiplying breeders, sustainable poultry production breeders all over North America, frankly, and all around the world. So what I'm going to do for the next um, 20 minutes or so is I'm going to teach you about what is a real chicken. And you're going to want to take notes. So get a pen, get a piece of paper. I'm going to teach you some things about uh, uh, what a real chicken is. And this will give you a great inter introduction to raising sustainable poultry. All right? So here's the deal. What is a real chicken? Okay, what is a real chicken? The first thing I want to um, introduce to you is that a real chicken, one that is sustainable for breeding, is one that is bred to a written standard. It's bred to a written standard. You're probably really, really familiar with the term heritage chickens, heritage turkeys, heritage cows, heritage sheep, and heritage this, and heritage that. And, 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 but actually, what I would encourage you to do, I don't use the word heritage in anything that I teach, that I write when I'm helping people to understand what is a real chicken? A true real chicken is a standard bred chicken. Now you say, what is a standard? What do you mean it has to, a, a real chicken is bred to a standard? All right, let me introduce to you this incredible book. It's called The Standard of Perfection. All right, you see it? It's called The Standard of Perfection. The Standard of Perfection is a, a, a book that has over 250 different breeds and varieties of chickens. Over 250 breeds and varieties. Here's a Chanticleer, that's a Canadian breed. The Rhode Island Reds, the Plymouth Rocks, the New Hampshires, the Dorkings, uh, the Americanas, the Buff Orpingtons. All of those birds, all those chickens, have a written description in this book that we call the Standard of Perfection. Okay? Now, the Standard of Perfection, it's published by the American Poultry Association. And I am very loyal to the organization. Uh, the American Poultry Association was organized. It's one of the oldest livestock organizations in North America. It was organized in 1873 in a place called Buffalo, New York. That's where the American Poultry Association founded and started in 1873. The very next year, in 1874, they, they, they started publishing the standard of perfection. It's a book about 
that describes all the breeds and varieties of chickens, ducks, geese, turkeys, and now we have guineas in the standard of perfection. So I share that with you in the sense that if it's a true chicken or a turkey or a, or a standard bred duck or a goose, it has to have a written standard. That's a real chicken. That's a real bird. Now, as I, as I said, the standard, as you think about it, the book has been around for a hundred and almost 150 years. And so the book gives you a written description of what it should look like. So it's, it's, it's breast and it's back. Should it have a long back or a short back? Uh, it tells you what kind of a comb the chicken should have. It tells you the tail angles. It tells you what it was developed for. It gives you history about the bird. You need to get a standard of perfection. Go to the American Poultry Association website and buy one of those standards, okay? So you may say, why does it have to have a written standard? Well, hopefully at the end of this, it'll make sense. So first and foremost, a real chicken, a standard bred chicken is defined by having a written standard. Number two, number two, a true real chicken, a standard bred chicken, it has to be able to naturally reproduce. Now you're like, oh, Mr. Jim. Yes, I know I have many chickens that can naturally reproduce. Well, let me give you a little bit of information that maybe you didn't know. When I worked in the turkey industry, we raised about a million birds a year. And all million birds that we raised, they could not naturally reproduce. None of them. Here's how it would work. We would have a breeder farm and there would be like, a thousand female turkeys. Those are called hens. And we'd have about 500 toms. 500 toms. A tom is a male turkey. And the only way that these birds, we could reproduce them is we would hire a group of men, usually women didn't get into this, to go and collect semen from the 500 boy turkeys. They would take that semen and they would, they would uh, inseminate it into the females. See, the turkeys could not naturally mate. They couldn't naturally mate. And the reason for that is because they grew to be so big. They were so big and they grew so fast that these turkeys could not naturally reproduce. Now, you may say, oh, that's crazy. It is crazy. But here's the thing, that is true of all the commercial turkeys around the world and definitely in North America. So all the big boys, even your organic turkeys, if you get you know anything from Butterball or Tyson or Jenny O ty uh, turkeys or, or um, any big turkey company, even organic turkeys, if they are not a standard bred turkey, they cannot naturally mate. They cannot naturally reproduce. Now, it's also true of a chicken called a Cornish cross. A Cornish cross chicken is a terminal bird. It's a terminal bird. It cannot naturally reproduce. Now, I'll come and I'll tell you a little bit more about those in just a minute. So number one, if it's a real chicken, if it's a real turkey, duck or a goose, but I'm talking primarily chickens and turkeys now, it has to be able to naturally reproduce and it has to be in, have a written standard. Number three, number three, if it's a real chicken, it has to be, uh, it was um, a standard bred chicken is one that was developed for a specific purpose in a specific region. So let me illustrate it to you this way. Let me say that again. Write this down. A standard bred chicken or standard bred poultry were developed 
Don't miss this. It's very, very important. They were developed for a specific purpose in a specific region. For an example, you've probably heard of a Rhode Island red chicken, okay? Well, a Rhode Island red chicken, if you had to guess, where did that chicken come from? I'm pausing. What are you saying? What are you saying? <laughs> yes, if it's from, called a Rhode Island red chicken, it was developed in Rhode Island, okay? So now, and I know that's profound, but so it's in a Rhode Island red, the bird was developed to be a slow growing, uh, a strong, sustainable egg layer for cold weather, all right? It was specifically developed, the Rhode Island Red, around the late 1800s, early 1900s, and that bird probably more early 1800s, and it was developed very specifically for Rhode Island Red to have good production, good egg production over a long period of time. How about a New Hampshire chicken? Guess where that bird came from? Yes, New Hampshire. Have you ever heard of a Wyandot chicken? A Wyandot chicken, now it doesn't have, it's not named after a state, but it was actually developed in upstate New York. What's the weather like in upstate New York? The weather is cold. It's brutally cold, especially in the winter. Upstate New York. Now a Wyandot chicken, I'd love to show you a picture, but maybe you come and visit me sometime and I'll show you some really, really awesome wine dots that are, that are bred to the standard of perfection, okay? But a wine dot was a bird that was developed for cold weather. So it has a short body and it has a deep body. It has good down on its feathers. It has what we call a rose comb. The rose comb means the comb is close to the head. A single comb is a comb that's single and it stands up and it's more prone to freeze. A wine dot that was developed in upstate New York, it has a rose comb. It's a comb that very seldom, if never, freezes. Never freezes. And the comb is a very, very important part of a chicken. It actually regulates the temperature of the bird. All the blood of the bird runs through the comb. So it's a really, really important part. So I want you to understand that a real chicken, a standard bred chicken, they're developed in a specific uh, region and they're for a specific purpose. Every single chicken in the standard of perfection was developed with a very specific purpose. They were developed for warm climates or cold climates. They were developed, now all these birds in the standard of perfection were developed for outdoors versus confinement. Here's the thing. People all across North America, people are taking these birds we call Cornish cross, the terminal bird that I mentioned to you. They were developed to be raised in a building. They were developed to be raised in a building. And we take them and we put them outside and we try to have pastured poultry with the chicken that was never developed to be outside. And so when I'm talking about a standard bread, like a Delaware, a New Hampshire, or a barred Plymouth Rock, these are all breeds that were developed to be outside. It's very, very important. Also, these chickens were developed, you know, to be productive for a long period of time. A female chicken, we want her to be productive for like four to six years. And the males from <clears throat> maybe five to seven years, okay? So number one, it has to be bred to a written standard if it's a real chicken. Number two, a standard bred chicken or standard bred poultry have to be able to naturally mate. And number three, which is really, really, really important, you want to remember that a real chicken, 
when you're picking out and selecting a breed of chickens, you want to remember that every bird, every real chicken was developed with a specific purpose in a specific region. Now, there's basically three purposes with chickens. It's either an egg producing chicken, a meat producing chicken, or a dual purpose. In other words, we use them for both meat and eggs. Okay, so when you're selecting a breed and you can reach out to me or do some, be really, really careful what you read on the internet. There's so much false information about real chickens and what the descriptions are. It's really, really inaccurate is the word I would give you. Okay, so number four, here's the fourth thing about a real chicken. A standard bred chicken, if it's real, like one that we're, I'm referring to in the standard of perfection, it will grow at a normal growth rate. Or you may refer to it as a slow growth rate. I call it a normal growth rate. See, here's what's shocking. I'll give you uh, an example. You know, I mentioned to you about the, the Cornish cross chicken. Let me educate you a little bit about the chicken that you most likely eat in your house, in your home, in your kitchen, on your plate, okay? Cornish cross, the average chicken in America that you, you and I eat for meat, okay? It is processed. That means it's butchered on the average of 37 days of age. Now you think about that. If you've ever raised a chicken, you take 30 days a month, add seven days, 37 days. And a normal chicken would only be just this big, not very big. Well, a Cornish cross, it is ready to be processed. It's ready to be butchered at 37 days of age. It grows really fast, really fast. Actually, if a human being grew as fast as a Cornish cross, a two-year-old child would weigh about 360 pounds. They're big. They grow fast. And listen, they don't grow fast because they're injected with anything. They don't grow fast because of what they eat. Now, sometimes food will influence it, but the primary reason that these fast-growing chickens, these terminal chickens that grow fast is because of genetic engineering, genetic breeding. It's because of the birds, the parents and the grandparents that are selected for breeding they grow fast, they grow fast, they grow fast, they grow fast. And what happens is every generation, you take a, 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 a fast-growing male and a fast-growing female and you cross them. And the next generation, you put faster-growing birds in the breeding pen and they get bigger and bigger and bigger, faster and faster and faster, okay? And all those birds are terminal, they were never, ever meant to live very long. They were only meant to live for about 37 days, maybe six, seven, eight weeks at the very, very most. Now, so I want you to think about this. Um, and, and if you're going to raise sustainable breeding chickens or turkeys, they have to, and you want to get a flock of birds, you know, and, and you think about this during the uh, coronavirus pandemic, what a more, there is not a more significant time in your life, on the life of your farm to consider breeding sustainable genetics, birds that can naturally reproduce. I'll tell you, one of my favorite breeds. I have raised over 50 different breeds and varieties of chickens, ducks, geese, turkeys in the last 40 years. And one of my very favorite breeds is a barred Plymouth Rock. It's one of the oldest breeds in North America. In the early 1900s, a barred Plymouth Rock was, it was the most popular meat chicken. And 
We, as a sustainable poultry network, we're mentoring new breeders. And, and we're looking for people who want to be involved and in learning how to breed their own chickens. See, I encourage you, when you breed your own, then you're not dependent upon an outside resource to get the birds, the baby chicks. You're going to Tractor Supply or your local farm store, and they're getting these baby chicks from these large hatcheries that do not breed to the standard of perfection. You're getting birds that are not uh, being bred for their original um, development, their original purpose. Now there are, uh, I'm just going to mention a couple things for about 10 more minutes. Let me give you kind of some advantages and disadvantages of raising the terminal birds versus a true standard bred chicken, all right? First, let me tell you about the advantages of a terminal bird that grows fast. Number one, the bird grows fast. It's fast growth. You can process that bird in 37 days. All right, that's an advantage, okay? Number two, one of the advantages of a, of a, 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 a Cornish cross, a fast-growing industrial chicken, is they're all uniform. They all look the same. That's what we're used to. That's what you're used to. A lot of people are used to that, okay? So they're uniform, all right? Number three, the feed conversion. They, the amount of meat that you get really, really fast is really good. I mean, it's like they eat, they grow one pound of meat for every two pounds of feed that they eat, all right? That's a really good, what we call feed conversion. The feed conversion is very, very good, okay? That's why they made them. It's a very cheap chicken. It's very, very cheap, okay? So those three major advantages of an industrial chicken. But let me mention to you, okay? Here's the disadvantages of growing a, a, uh, a terminal Cornish cross chicken that grows fast, right? A few things I wanna mention, disadvantages. Number one, I've mentioned it multiple times, the bird is terminal. You cannot take your Cornish cross males and your Cornish cross females and mate them together and hatch your own babies. You can't. It's, it, it will not work. The birds are too heavy. Um, and there's a multiple reasons why, and I'm going to hit to them. Second thing I want you to remember, as I just said, they can't naturally reproduce their, after their own kind. All right, number three. Another disadvantage of these industrial growing, fast growing birds is that the genetics are controlled. They're controlled. There's only like three major genetic companies uh, in the world that own the genetics of a Cornish cross chicken. Now, some companies, they try to make their own and some hatcheries call them one thing and another hatchery calls them another thing. But they're all very, very similar in the way they were developed. They're fast growing, they get fat, and they own the genetics. So what they've done is they want you, and if you're against industrialization of anything, then you should be, you should be opposed to buying industrial chickens, even if you raise them outside on pasture. I, my vision and passion and burden is why are you supporting industrial baby chicks when you don't support industrial food, industrial grains, you don't like GMO grains, then why are you supporting industrial genetic chicken companies? All the genetics are controlled. Here's another disadvantage, all right? The birds have, because they grow so fast, they have a ton of physical complications. If you've ever raised them, and you can, you can YouTube this and you'll see it. You'll see so many deformities of these fast-growing Cornish cross chickens. They have leg deformities. They have... They have uh, congestive heart failure. They, the, the faster they grow, the older they get, the more prone they are to have heart attacks. I've talked to many, many Tyson growers or Pilgrim's Pride growers who grow these birds. 
and the, they hit a certain age and they just start dying. Because their bodies cannot keep up, their heart, their lungs, their liver, their body organs, they can't keep up with all this growth. They just start dying. Does that sound normal to you? It's not normal. It's not normal at all. All right. So if you care about welfare, see, welfare is not just about animal welfare, chicken welfare, turkey welfare. It's not just about, oh, they got to be able to go outside. You got to give them enough room. They need to be able to see the sunshine and, and they need to be able to eat grass. You know what? I agree with all those things. I totally agree with all those things. But my passion, and I challenge you, what about the genetics? What about the bird itself? And one of the disadvantages of these fast-growing birds is their physical complications. Another one is, fifth one, is they have poor immune systems. They have poor immune systems. They have, they don't have the ability to live outside. You ask every, well, I can tell you, every commercial chicken farm will vaccinate. They give them antibiotics, all of them. It's very, very difficult for these birds to live because their immune systems are so low and so poor, so poor. Even people who are out trying to raise a few of them and have organic chickens. I know we raised a million organic turkeys a year. I can tell you that it was so difficult to keep these birds alive. And, and so because their immune systems are so weak, it's because of what they've engineered and the way they do selective breeding. So I challenge you. The other one is this. Number six, and I'll kind of wrap this up, all right? They also, I want you to remember this. They also don't have, a, a the faster a chicken grows, the less nutritional value it has. Write this down. The, the, uh, the longer a chicken is alive, the more nutrition it will have. The longer a chicken is alive, the better it will taste. The longer a chicken is alive, the more nutrients, because it has a chance to grow at a normal rate and the nutrition is much stronger. It's much stronger. You know, it's why one of my good friends, uh, he's a chef, he said, that's why the colonel, the colonel at Kentucky Fried Chicken had to add like what? 11 different flavors. Because a chicken that grows fast, it has no flavor. But a real chicken that's bred from the standard of perfection, like a, a New Hampshire or a Bard Plymouth Rock or a Delaware, or even one of the, you ever heard of a chicken called a dorking chicken? They're phenomenal tasting because they grow slow. They're silver gray dorkings. You think about turkeys and the, the bronze turkey, the standard bronze turkey. And there's a turkey called a, a bourbon red turkey that was developed in Bourbon County, Kentucky. All right? So I want to encourage you. I hope this makes sense to you. That... A real chicken, these four things, it has to be, if it's real, a turkey and there's ducks and geese, you want to breed them to the number one, the standard of perfection, it has a written standard. Number two, it's able to naturally reproduce. Number three, it has a specific purpose and was developed in a very specific region, not just in North America, but we have a whole bunch of breeds of chickens that come from England. And so you've got Cornish. I'm not talking about Cornish cross, I'm talking about a, a the, the greatest meat board be a bird ever created is called a dark cornice. And they can naturally mate. I have some awesome pictures of them. So you have, when I say a specific purpose in a specific region, it's all over Europe as well. There's birds that were breeds that were developed in Australia and different parts of the world in India. Okay. So and number four is if it's a true chicken, a standard bred chicken or a standard bred turkey, it'll grow at a normal growth rate. Now listen, where do you get these good birds? Well, you've come to the right place. 
You're talking to the right guy. I encourage you, email me. Go to the website, Sustainable Poultry Network USA, SPNUSA.com is the website. And you can email me off there. Or my email is jim at center, no, excuse me, jim at SPNUSA.com. Jim at SPNUSA.com, all right? And we'll help you. If you go to our website, we have certified breeders in the Sustainable Poultry Network. And they are breeding the birds that I'm telling you. The real birds. And we're looking for more breeders. We want to, we have a coaching program, a mentoring program, and we would love for you to consider it. So check it out. But I'll also tell you, the last word I'll give you is you need to go to the website of the American Poultry Association and get yourself a standard of perfection, a standard of perfection, all right? Hey, it's a privilege for me. I want to say thank you again to the West Virginia Urban Agriculture Conference. Thank you for allowing me to make this presentation. And um, I look forward to hearing from some of you. So enjoy the conference. And uh, I hope this was helpful. And I hope you learned a lot. So thanks a million. Take care. And uh, happy chickening. <laughs>